Okay, I'm gonna start the streaming in a second now. Um, because I have to be muted uh, real quick on one side and the other. Um, Matthias, I also make you co-host just in case. No problem. Oh, um, oh no, sorry, Matthias. Okay, I'm gonna start no way I can um, stream it in a second now. No, no, I muted. Good. Oh, I won't get where to my phone. Let me close the window. So this goes this way. Excellent. Great. Um, I think, let me share the screen to, uh, real quick. I'll introduce the speaker. Uh, you guys see the screen, I believe, right? So I wanted to welcome everybody um, once again to the uh, online Spice Spin Plantex seminar. Uh, as you know, uh, this is uh, organized by Spin Phenomen Interdisciplinary Center that I organize uh, together with Kyrie Universal City, which is who is a uh, W3 professor in Duisburg now, in collaboration with the uh, uh, Spin Plus X Collaboration Research Center uh, led by Martina Schliemann and Burkhard Hillebrands in Kaiserslautern and Matthias Chloe in Mainz. Uh, this is a Zoom live seminar, meaning that uh, you will be attending as an attendee, but please raise your hand or write in the Q&A uh, questions for the speaker, and I'll be able to give you the floor and promote you to panelists uh, to pass the questions directly. Uh, also, we have a still uh, three or four or five more talks uh, on the left for the year. Uh, please uh, check out the schedule, and as usual, it's on Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Uh, today's uh, speaker inaugurated the series. Uh, Thomas Agworth is a longtime friend, collaborator, of course, of our group. Um, he's the head of the Department of Electronics and Nanoelectronics uh, at the Academy of Science of the Czech Republic, and also uh, a professor at Nottingham University. Uh, he's uh, graduated in 1997, uh, where we overlapped actually during our uh, schooling years, and has received many honors and awards. Uh, he's a member of the Academy of uh, Europe, member of the Learned Society of the Czech Republic, European Research Council Advanced Grants, and was actually part of, of the uh, European Scientific Council. Um, and uh, in the recent years, he's uh, known to have a spring, uh, the uh, year of antiferromagnetic spintronics, uh, particularly from the beginning to manipulate uh, antiferromagnets uh, actively, which was in fact uh, the push of his advanced grant. So with that, he actually created, uh, as promised, a new field that is now extremely active. Um, so with that, I will uh, stop sharing and I will ask Thomas to go ahead and uh, share your, uh, uh, your talk. And uh, go ahead and start whenever you can. Can you? Okay. Yes, I'm trying to, uh, like Arrow, I'm trying to find my. Uh, it's on the lower computer. left, it should be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm move to the lower left. It's just stuck. Perfect. Perfect. Good. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Arrow, thanks a lot uh, for the introduction. And uh, today uh, I will talk to you about ultra magnetism, uh, uh, which we regard as uh, a new emerging basic uh, magnetic phase. And uh, we regard this as a, uh, as a basic magnetic phase because of the following uh, features. Uh, it is realized in uh, compensated collinear non frustrated magnetic structures. Uh, they generate non relativistic spin split uncorrelated band structures. And they offer alternative phenomenology in uh, core spin physics and spintronics or spin electronics. Moreover, uh, the phase occupies a separate uh, symmetry class, uh, is abundant, 
among uh, magnetic materials and is relevant in, in many fields. So before I flip uh, to the next page, uh, let me acknowledge first uh, Libor uh, and Cairo for enabling this talk. And also uh, I'd like to acknowledge all our team members and uh, collaborators uh, who enabled this series of recent articles that we put together on uh, this uh, emerging field. Uh, before I get to uh, the third, uh, we regard as the third basic magnetic phase of ultramagnetism, let me briefly recap the two uh, basic magnetic phases that are well known for uh, uh, almost a century uh, and are well established. So the first one is ferromagnetism and the uh, uh, key example here is, uh, is uh, uh, iron lattice of these uh, collinear magnetic moments. Uh, they generate a global uh, magnetic order and the global nature uh, of the magnetic order with the net magnetization has two important consequences. Uh, first of all, uh, these uh, ferromagnets tend to be uh, have their carriers delocalized, be metallic, meaning that the Fermi level is inside a band. And second, because of the uh, global magnetization, the bands are spin split. <clears throat> uh, that means that carriers that uh, can carry electrical current uh, in these metallic ferromagnets also carry the uh, magnetic uh, magnetization information or the spin information. And in ferromagnets, it's relatively easy to flip magnetization, for example, by weak uh, magnetic fields. And uh, this way, we can also flip the magnetic information that is carried by electrons. So this is the core uh, spin physics in ferromagnets. And the core spin electronics uh, is basically three uh, phenomena. Uh, the first phenomenon is in ferromagnetic thin films, and it's the uh, anomalous Hall effect. And here, the, uh, the fact that we have uh, spin polarized carriers <clears throat> results in the Hall effect in which we apply an electrical bias. And in response, these uh, spin polarized carriers will accumulate at one edge of the sample or will generate uh, a transverse current. And uh, <clears throat> the spin polarization of this transverse current will be determined by the uh, magnetization direction in the ferromagnet. Now, when you flip the magnetization, the transverse current will also reverse. Uh, the uh, other two uh, core spintronic phenomena in ferromagnets are giant magnetoresistance and spin transfer torque. In this time, uh, we look at a longitudinal uh, transfers, a uh, longitudinal transport uh, response <clears throat> in which the electrical bias generates a longitudinal spin polarized current. And these phenomena are realized in uh, devices uh, comprising two uh, ferromagnetic electrodes, a fixed electrode and uh, uh, an electrode which can reverse its magnetization. And now depending on the relative orientation of the magnetization in the uh, reference in the fixed electrode and in the other electrode, we get either low or high resistance state and that's giant magnetic resistance. But also uh, the spin uh, uh, polarized currents in this structure can also induce the reorientation of the top electrode uh, by electrical currents instead of, uh, instead of magnetic fields, for example. <clears throat> so the anomalous Hall effect is very intriguing uh, because it's a transverse non-dissipative uh, electrical response. And it can also have intriguing uh, topological uh, uh, varied phase uh, origin. Uh, the longitudinal uh, uh, response is interesting primarily because it offers a large signal. And this is the reason why this uh, uh, spin uh, electronic phenomena are used in current spintronic commercial uh, devices. Now, we, when we go to the second uh, uh, basic magnetic phase uh, uh, of these uh, nails uh, antiferromagnets or nails antiferromagnetism, it really has been, uh, it's been discovered by Nail in the 1930s and has been regarded really as an opposite uh, to ferromagnetism. So uh, the magnetic ordering now is not global, but it's on this local uh, character where the neighboring uh, magnetic atoms have their magnetic moments aligned in anti-parallel fashion here. 
And this uh, local nature then tends to favor uh, more localized electrons in the band structure uh, or in the, uh, in, the, in the material resulting more in a insulating like character. That means that the Fermi level tends to be in the band gap. Simultaneously, uh, the local antiparallel order uh, is also regarded in these classic antiparallel magnets uh, 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 to result in uh, spin degenerate bands. <clears throat> now, the, the canonical example that Nail liked to uh, show of um, antiferromagnetism is this iron lattice uh, in a material like a rutile. Uh, crystal, uh, a fluoride rutile crystal. Now, uh, when we look at the lattice of these iron magnetic moments, <clears throat> there is even a formal mathematical theorem uh, that uh, guarantees that the bands uh, originating from such a lattice would be uh, a spin degenerate. It's uh, Kramer's theorem, and the Kramer's theorem uh, goes in these two uh, lines. Uh, the first one is when we consider uh, a combined transformation of space inversion and time reversal and how this transformation acts on our spin and momentum dependent energies in the bands. So when we apply uh, uh, space inversion and time reversal on spin, we reverse spin because spin is reversed by time reversal operation and it's invariant under space inversion. But when we apply both these operations or transformations on the momentum, both would reverse the momentum, so altogether momentum stays the same. <clears throat> if, uh, uh, moreover, a system has a symmetry uh, that combines this uh, inversion, uh, 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 space inversion and time reversal transformation, then it means that its energy bands have to be invariant under this symmetry transformation. Uh, and if we combine these two lines, we obtain that systems which do have this PT symmetry have spin degenerate bands at every uh, momentum. And if you look at this uh, simple uh, lattice of irons with antiparallel uh, magnetic moments, then in principle, any uh, lattice which has only two magnetic atoms in the unit cell and their moments are antiparallel, you will have a combination of space inversion and time reversal operations, which will bring you to the original state. So these systems always have this PT symmetry. So unlike uh, ferromagnets, which are electronically and magnetically active, or well, we have anti-ferromagnets, uh, which are electronically inert because they tend to be insulating. And they are also magnetically inert because uh, their bands do not carry uh, the magnetic uh, information. And also these systems are insensitive to external uh, magnetic perturbations. Now, it is very likely this reason of uh, being uh, uh, electronically and magnetically inert that uh, well, Louis Neil uh, noted in his uh, Nobel lecture that uh, uh, antiferromagnetism is interesting, but it does not appear to have any practical applications. <clears throat> Well, on the other hand, uh, Neil was uh, a very practically oriented uh, uh, researcher. And uh, one of his uh, 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 major contributions on the practical side was the defense uh, against magnetic mines by demagnetizing ship hulls during the Second World War. So this seems like a, a paradox. Uh, why magnets that can microscopically, precisely, and for free demagnetize themselves cannot be useful if this uh, macroscopic, uh, uh, very rough, uh, approximate, and very expensive demagnetization of the entire ship hulls was of such a huge uh, a practical life-saving importance. And it was this paradox, if you want, uh, that uh, has driven much of uh, the research in antiferromagnetic spintronics over the past decade. Uh, now, uh, when trying to make uh, antiferromagnets active components in electronic devices, uh, we had to change one aspect of antiferromagnetism, and that was switching from insulating to uh, metallic antiferromagnets. And copper manganese arsenide and manganese to gold are the two prime examples of such uh, metallic antiferromagnets. 
On the other hand, they are still uh, a conventional or classic anti-chiral magnets in the sense that they perfectly obey uh, the Kramer's theorem, Kramer's spin degeneracy theorem, so their bands are not spin polarized. So uh, antiferromagnetic spintronics uh, uh, is interesting uh, compared to ferromagnetic spintronics because we can develop devices or spintronics without uh, magnetization. On the other hand, uh, we have to rely uh, uh, on spintronic devices without uh, the core spin electronic phenomena known in ferromagnets like anomalous holophore giant magneto resistances or spin transfer torque because those are derived from spin split bands. Uh, still, it was possible uh, during the decade to demonstrate many uh, intriguing functionalities of uh, <clears throat> antiferromagnetic spintronic devices. Now, this is a very heavily biased uh, illustration of these uh, functionalities biased towards the work that our groups have uh, been interested in. For example, demonstrating a proof of concept microelectronic memory bits in antiferromagnets, straight field free and field insensitive uh, neuromorphic logic and memory devices and switching in the very same uh, material and device scaled from uh, relatively long electronic pulses towards much shorter terahertz pulses and the ultra short uh, femtosecond laser pulses. Uh, but these are just examples. This is now a, a relatively broad field uh, with a number of groups around the world active in the field. And uh, I give at least uh, a few uh, references to review articles on antiferromagnetic spintronics. So uh, it looks like uh, we really have uh, <laughs> exhausted uh, uh, the landscape of basic uh, magnetic phases, basic spin physics and electronics uh, by uh, this collinear ferromagnetism and collinear uh, antiferromagnetism. In one case, we have a net magnetization and spin splitting in the bands. In the other case, we have zero magnetization and spin degeneracy in bands. <clears throat> well, and indeed, if you regard bands as just stripes of uh, allowed energies uh, in your spectrum, then there doesn't seem to be any third option. If you just regard them as stripes, those two stripes can be either split or overlap. It's very hard to imagine that there can be any other option than that. Uh, but uh, uh, energy spectrum is not composed of stripes, but it has dispersion. So there is an energy dependence on the momentum. And when you have energy dependence on, on the momentum, you can have this third option in which uh, you have zero net magnetization. However, uh, simultaneously, your bands are spin split. And they are spin split in this regular alternating uh, 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 shape. Now, uh, in which system can you realize uh, uh, such an electronic structure? <clears throat> uh, remarkably, uh, it's ruthenium dioxide. And this is really the material uh, which has uh, attracted our attention uh, to this new type of spin physics and uh, spin electronics. It is really remarkable that it's, uh, it's Nails' rutile crystal structure. So it's the type of crystal uh, that uh, been mentioned in many textbooks as the classic representation of antiferromagnetism. So uh, how come that we can have spin split bands? Well, when we talked about Kramer's theorem and spin degeneracy, we really looked at only at the magnetic atoms uh, in the lattice. Uh, and ignored the other non-magnetic atoms in the lattice because uh, naively one could, would think that non-magnetic atoms would not have any profound effect on the basic core uh, magnetism physics of a crystal. However, this is not the case. When we take the root out crystal, and now besides these uh, the lattice of the magnetic atoms, we include also the lattice of the non-magnetic atoms, in this particular case, oxygen. What happens is, that uh, there is no inversion, uh, space inversion operation that would anymore connect the two opposite magnetic uh, sublattices. This inversion symmetry is broken. And instead, the two sublattices are connected by this crystal rotation operation by 90 degrees. And it's this uh, crystal rotation 
symmetry that guarantees that an energy eigenstate <coughs> uh, of a spin up and uh, uh, the spin up energy eigenstate will have a counterpart equal energy eigenstate in the band structure with the opposite spin. But now these two guys will not uh, exist at the same momentum, but the momentum will be also rotated and the rotation of the momentum will be given by the same 90 degree rotation as is the rotation symmetry that connects in real space the opposite spin sublattices. So while in this case uh, with the inversion uh, symmetry connecting the opposite uh, spin sublattices, uh, the opposite spin eigenstates were connected at the same wave vector. Here the opposite spin equal energy eigenstates are connected at wave vectors which are mutually rotated uh, by this 90 degree uh, symmetry duration. So, uh, as I said in the beginning, I will not regard this uh, in this talk as an antiferromagnetic anomaly, but instead uh, will regard this uh, as an antiferromagnetic or ferromagnetic anomaly. I actually don't know because uh, zero magnetization sounds like an antiferromagnet, spin split electronic structure sounds more like a ferromagnet. So, I'm not going to regard this as an anomaly of either ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic phase but rather as an emerging third uh, basic magnetic phase. I already walked you through these uh, characteristic uh, features. Uh, so I, what I will do now is that I will discuss these features in more detail, and I will do it in two blocks. <clears throat> the first one, in the first one, I will show how the combination of compensated and spin-split non-relativistic band structures can lead to alternative phenomenology in the core spin physics and uh, spin uh, electronics. So let me start uh, with the core spin physics. <clears throat> and here uh, I will show you uh, that uh, ultramagnets offer a non-relativistic ultramagnetic uh, spin splitting mechanism, <clears throat> uh, which originates from a local inversion symmetric uh, electric crystal field. So let me uh, explain this uh, step by step. So first we start uh, in the non-magnetic phase of ruthenium dioxide, and we will plot uh, <clears throat> an illustrative uh, image of the band structure in the non in the non-magnetic phase. Now what we observe is that uh, <clears throat> there is a band anisotropy. Uh, uh, which is due to uh, the local inversion symmetric electric crystal field. So when I, for example, look at the sublattice A dominated band, it is anisotropic with respect to the Kx and Ky uh, momenta. And the anisotropy is due to the local inversion symmetric but anisotropic crystal environment of the sublattice A. Now, when I look at the band which is dominated by the B sublattice, it's also anisotropic, but the anisotropy is rotated with respect to the A sublattice by 90 degrees. This is the rotation symmetry which connects the two sublattices in the real space. So, as a result, I have a non magnetic K dependent band splitting in my electronic structure, uh, which is strong because it's of the electric crystal field origin and in ruthenium dioxide is on the electron volt scale. Now, when I move to the ultramagnetic phase, we will now see what happens when I turn on the magnetism or the ultramagnetic uh, interaction. What you will see is that uh, the A sublattice dominated band will split with one sign uh, of the spin splitting because it corresponds to one uh, sublattice and uh, magnetic sublattice. And the sublattice B will split spin split with the opposite sign because it's the opposite spin sublattice. So let's now play slowly the movie and we see what happens. The sublattice A starts to split with one sign and sublattice B splits uh, with uh, the opposite sign. <clears throat> so what do we get as a result is that when we add this K independent exchange splitting, which is opposite, on bands dominated by sublattice A, 
uh, and bands uh, dominated by sublattice B here. So if I have this opposite K independent uh, exchange splittings, as a result, I get an ultramagnetic K dependent spin splitting of my nearest bands, which is just a copy of the non magnetic K dependent band splitting in the non magnetic phase. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, compared uh, to the two uh, well known spin splitting mechanisms uh, in physics, this is uh, uh, a completely orthogonal, if you want, a completely alternative mechanism of spin splitting. Uh, what we know from uh, conventional ferromagnetism is that the spin splitting is determined by the strength of the magnetic exchange and is due to the global ferromagnetic order. And the alternative one is uh, uh, electric uh, splitting, but it's weak because, of, because it's of relativistic origin and is due to the global inversion asymmetry. <clears throat> In our case, we have splitting due to the electric field but it's non-relativistic, so it's strong. And it's also due to the local uh, inversion symmetric uh, crystal field. So this was uh, a, a, an illustration of an alternative uh, core spin physics. And now I give you uh, an illustration of an alternative core spin electronics, <coughs> which we can get in uh, ultramagnets. So the first key question is, can we get in ultramagnets spin polarized currents? This is what drives uh, conventional ferromagnetic spintronics. And the answer is yes. If we uh, uh, look at these bands, then make a, a cut, uh, equal energy cut, and just draw the Fermi surface of an ultramagnet, we see that we have two anisotropic uh, Fermi surfaces corresponding to one spin uh, orientation and another rotated anisotropic Fermi surface corresponding to the opposite spin. Now, uh, when we apply electrical current, <clears throat> uh, we get an axis of uh, 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 right moving uh, electrons with spin up, uh, and we have a small axis, smaller axis of right moving uh, electrons uh, with spin down. So we generate uh, a, an electrical current uh, which is predominantly carried by spin up electrons. So the current is spin polarized. And this is the uh, prerequisite of uh, all the key uh, uh, ferromagnetic spintronic phenomena, which now we can, however, realize in our ultramagnets, which have zero net magnetization, so they don't generate any straight fields. We can generate uh, giant magneto resistance effects in which we either have in the two layers. Uh, parallel configuration or anti parallel uh, configuration. And DFT calculations show that the phenomena can be of comparable strength to ferromagnets. We can also have a geometry in which we consider the tunneling occurring uh, between those two layers. And again, DFT calculations uh, in ruthenium dioxide predict uh, a very large uh, TMR ratios. Uh, we can also have uh, 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 a very uh, same uh, physical principle, but now having a different geometry of the phenomenon. In this case, we will apply the uh, electrical current instead of along one of the main anisotropy axes of the Fermi surface, we will apply it in the uh, 45 degree rotated direction. <clears throat> in this case, we will generate uh, an electrical current, longitudinal electrical current, which is not spin polarized. However, what we generate is uh, electrical currents, in this case, of spin down electrons, which is deflected uh, downwards with respect to the applied bias. And we get electrical current of upspins, which is deflected upwards with respect to the applied electrical bias. So as a result, we generate a pure spin current uh, in a transfer direction to the applied electrical bias. And because this is a non-relativistic effect, uh, it's not a surprise that the DFT calculations give us a very large uh, angle, uh, uh, the spin splitter angle, uh, which means that the, uh, the spin current that we generate uh, will be uh, very strong. Uh, another important feature is that uh, the flow of the spin current is transfers to the applied electrical bias. But the polarization of the spin current is arbitrary or is independent 
of uh, the direction of the applied bias. It's governed by the equilibrium uh, direction of the nail vector, which in principle, uh, you can manipulate independently of the direction of the applied current. So now you can imagine a, an experimental geometry in which you apply uh, a longitudinal uh, or in-plane electrical bias. This will generate an out-of-plane spin current. And this out-of-plane spin current you can use to induce a torque on the adjacent uh, magnetic wave. Now, when you compare it to uh, uh, the well-known uh, spin uh, transfer torque in ferromagnets, you see immediately the different geometry. In ferromagnetic spin transfer torque, both the applied uh, electrical bias and the spin polarized currents are parallel, so it's a longitudinal uh, effect. <clears throat> Uh, which can impose some limitations on devices, in particular uh, when the barrier is a thin insulating layer. Mm -hmm. uh, this can be uh, circumvented by uh, the relativistic spin orbitor, in which the applied electrical current is in plane and it generates an out of plane spin current, but it tends to be a weak effect because it's relativistic. And also, the spin polarization of the spin current tends to be connected. Uh, with the direction of the applied uh, electrical current because it's all connected by the spin orbit coupling. <clears throat> now, the important point that I want to emphasize here is that uh, this uh, transfer spin current in ultramagnets and, uh, has been uh, not only proposed theoretically, but there are already first experiments uh, which confirm the viability of this uh, scenario. <clears throat> the other core phenomenon uh, is uh, anomalous Hall effect. <clears throat> now, anomalous Hall effect uh, has a, a relativistic, uh, very curvature origin. Uh, uh, in this case, when we look at, uh, at our ultra magnet, so this is the non relativistic uh, Fermi surface. When we add the weak uh, relativistic spin orbit coupling and we zoom in uh, this uh, point, uh, this band crossing point, what we see is that. Uh, the relativistic spin orbit coupling will open a small gap uh, around this, uh, this crossing. And uh, spin orbit coupling will also induce uh, a rotation, a smooth rotation of our spins from down uh, to up uh, uh, as a function of this k vector in the small region around the crossing. And because it's only a small region of k vectors where the uh, spin makes this full reorientation, uh, the very curvature associated with this can be very large and can dominate the anomalous Hall effect. <clears throat> so uh, this uh, uh, very curvature origin of the Hall effect is something that ultramagnets uh, will share with ferromagnets. However, the distinction is that in ultramagnets, the position of these very curvature hotspots is determined by the non-relativistic ultramagnetic band structure, in particular, uh, will be determined by the crossing uh, in the non-relativistic band structure, which is imposed uh, by the ultramagnetic order. In ferromagnets, we typically rely on some accidental band crossings uh, which, uh, or anti-crossings which generate the very curvature. Now, again, uh, the uh, anomalous Hall effect in ruthenium dioxide uh, is not only a, 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 a theoretical proposal, uh, but there is also an experimental confirmation that this effect indeed exists in the team dioxide. Well, another uh, alternative phenomenology of anomalous Hall effect in ultramagnets is that uh, uh, when you uh, reorient your uh, anti uh, parallel moments or, or your nail vector from one crystallographic axis to a different crystallographic axis, what can happen is that the Hall effect completely disappears, meaning that for any orientation of the Hall bar, you will always measure a zero Hall signal. So that's uh, very uncommon in ferromagnets in which typically the Hall effect is proportional uh, to the magnetization uh, and typically independent of the direction of the magnetization with respect to crystal. But without an ultra magnets, you can turn on and off uh, the Hall uh, signal by reorienting uh, the nail vector. So this was the first part uh, of uh, ultramagnetic 
uh, phenomenology. And now we go to the second part where we look uh, uh, or where we demonstrate that ultramagnets occupy a separate symmetry class. And that leads us to an identification of, uh, uh, of a number of uh, uh, ultramagnetic materials and their relevance to many fields. <clears throat> So uh, let me now turn uh, to the discussion of uh, symmetries. <clears throat> so uh, what we were discussing so far, uh, the properties of uh, ultramagnets, in particular, of the uh, workhorse material, uh, this metallic ruthenium dioxide, uh, was a symmetry operation in which we did the crystallographic rotation by 90 degrees. And we said that this crystallography rotation connects the opposite spin sublattices. What it means is that the symmetry of such a spin arrangement on a crystal is a combination of a crystallographic 90 degree rotation with an 180 degree rotation in the space of the spin vectors. Now, the question is now, is this even possible? Can we even consider such a symmetry transformation in which the rotation in the real space is different from the rotation in the space of the spin vectors. Or in other words, uh, <clears throat> uh, rephrasing this question is, are the spin and real space coupled or are they uncoupled? Uh, <clears throat> in this, uh, if this was a symmetry uh, operation, it means that the real and spin space were actually uncoupled because we could apply different transformations in the two spaces. So the question is, are they coupled or are, are they uncoupled? Now, if you open Landau Lifshitz's uh, textbook, you will get an immediate answer. <laughs> uh, the spin and real spaces are coupled. And if the real and spin spaces are, are coupled, such a transformation, which combines different rotations in the real space and spin space will be prohibited. It doesn't exist in uh, such a symmetry formalism. You could only fi find operations uh, which are the same uh, transformations in the real space and in the spin space. And what is the physical justification for using such a mathematical symmetry formalism? It comes from classical physics on one hand, because in classical physics, magnetic moments are generated by the circulating uh, orbital uh, currents of the electrons. So clearly, uh, the real space uh, of the motion of these uh, charges is directly coupled uh, to the space of the magnetic moment vectors. <clears throat> if you go to the opposite uh, limit of sophistication, if you want, in physics, to the relativistic quantum mechanics, here we also have uh, a coupling between the vector uh, space of spin <clears throat> and the real space. And the coupling uh, uh, is uh, provided by this uh, relativistic Dirac equation uh, via the electric field, for example, of nuclei in, in our lives. So in both ends of classical and relativistic quantum mechanics, the spin space and the real space uh, are coupled. <clears throat> but as you see, I left here a, a, a free space in the middle, and I also left a free space at the bottom. And uh, what is it for? Uh, here, when we talk physics, in the middle between classical physics and the relativistic quantum mechanics, there is non-relativistic quantum mechanics, for example, of the exchange yeah. interaction. And we know that the non-relativistic exchange interaction is actually very important because it is responsible uh, in most cases for the magnetic ordering of spins in crystals. So it's a very important chapter of physics uh, in which, however, uh, the uh, space of spin vectors is not coupled uh, with the real space. <clears throat> and uh, 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 intriguingly, uh, there is already from the 1970s, you will find a mathematical literature in which uh, the spin symmetry transformations in this uncoupled spin and real spaces has been already fully developed. <clears throat> and so uh, in this mathematical uh, uh, toolbox, uh, what we have is not only symmetry operations uh, uh, 
in the coupled uh, real and spin space, meaning that you always have to apply the same transformation in the real space and in the spin space. But you can also consider the simultaneous operations in the, uh, uh, in the real space and spin space, which are different uh, transformations. So what you see here is that these uh, spin symmetry transformations contain all the magnetic symmetry transformations, but also much more. So they are a huge generalization. And that already suggests that this is the right toolbox to also find and describe uh, new magnetic phases. Now the, now the question is, which of the toolboxes is actually the right one? Uh, because they are very different. Now, the answer to this is it depends on the physics uh, that you are interested in. So if you're interested in the physics of non-relativistic spin splitting or non-relativistic spin electronics like GMR, this is the uh, useful toolbox uh, because it can contain uh, the symmetries in uncoupled spin and real space which govern this non-relativistic physics. If, however, you're interested in relativistic phenomena, for example, the weak uh, splitting of the bands caused by relativistic spin orbit coupling and the associated, for example, anomalous Hall effect, then the right uh, toolbox is the toolbox of symmetries in the coupled spin and real space. And then it's the absence of this symmetry transformation, which would then govern the anomalous Hall physics, Berry curvature, et cetera. <clears throat> but also from, from this example, you see, uh, that in this language of the coupled spin and real space transformations, you cannot disentangle the relativistic and non-relativistic origins of the spin splitting. It's impossible to say where the spin splitting uh, stops to be relativistic and begins to be of non-relativistic origin when you use this mathematical language of transformation in the coupled spaces. You have to go to the mathematical language of uncoupled spaces to be able to disentangle the non-relativistic spin splitting physics. Now, uh, we now have the right uh, toolbox uh, for describing our physics we're interested in, which is the non-relativistic uh, uh, spin physics and electronics of uh, ultramagnets. <clears throat> so uh, we just take a look at uh, uh, the literature from the 70s where this was mathematically uh, derived. And we look at the structure of the spin uh, symmetry transformations in the uncoupled spin and real space. And what we find is that there are two different types of transformations. One is the, uh, are the transformations that I already described. So you have a real space transformations and simultaneously and a spin space transformations and these two can be different. But then on the other hand, you can also have transformations which are just in the spin space. And they are of critical importance because these transformations can uh, separate collinear magnets from whole planar magnets and from non whole planar magnets. And for us, this is very important because ultramagnetism, we want to describe as this basic magnetic phase uh, 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 which is a magnetic phase of collinear magnets. And only uh, spin symmetries can actually help us to disentangle structures which are collinear from those which are non-collinear. So uh, collinear magnets <coughs> have these uh, spin space uh, symmetry transformations. What you can do is you can rotate your spin space around an axis which is parallel to the spin uh, at an arbitrary angle or you can do a spin space rotation around an axis which is in the plane orthogonal to the spins and then combine it with spin inversion. Spin inversion meaning flipping the sign of uh, the spin vector here. That's another uh, spin only transformation which is characteristic, characteristic of collinear magnets. <clears throat> if you go to coplanar magnets, this uh, uh, symmetry operation doesn't exist anymore. But what is still present is a symmetry operation which combines uh, the rotation by 180 degree, degrees with uh, spin inversion. And when you go to non complanar magnets, none of these uh, symmetries exist anymore. So the important message is that if we work in the spin symmetry transformation 
our mathematical language of uncoupled spin and loose spaces, we can disentangle collinear from non-collinear magnets. <clears throat> and uh, uh, that's very important because this is the type of physics we want to describe. So now uh, we have the entire uh, toolbox ready to do the classification of uh, non-relativistic uh, collinear magnetic phases. And when we go through this uh, derivation and the detailed step-by-step rigorous de derivation can be found in, in this uh, archive manuscript, you will find uh, that all uh, spin symmetry groups split into the three distinct types. The first type is what I just described, uh, was the ultramagnetism, in which the characteristic symmetries are uh, a, a symmetry which combines a crystallographic rotation, could be proper or improper, with this 180 degrees rotation in the spin space, and of course, a spin-only uh, symmetry characteristic of collinear magnets. Then the second class are spin, is spin degenerate antiferromagnetism, uh, in which uh, the characteristic symmetry is an inversion or translation uh, in the real space connected with this 180 degree uh, spin rotation. And again, combined uh, with the characteristic spin only uh, symmetry uh, of collinear magnets. And finally, we have ferromagnetism in which crystal uh, transformations, in which there is no crystal transformation uh, uh, combined with an 180 degree rotation of the spin space. Now, uh, when we do this complete uh, spin group classifications, what we find is that approximately one third of all spin groups are alter magnets. Another approximately one third are the spin degenerate antiferromagnets together with paramagnets, and the remaining approximately one third uh, belongs to uh, ferromagnetism. <clears throat> now we can, uh, uh, by analyzing the ultramagnetic spin groups, uh, we can then derive uh, a list of characteristic features of uh, uh, ultramagnets. Uh, first of all, ultramagnets can be realized both in inversion symmetric or inversion asymmetric magnetic crystals. But uh, independently of whether the magnetic crystal is inversion symmetric or asymmetric, the bands are always invariant under the inversion of momentum. So you will always have this character of bands. When you flip the sign of momentum, uh, you will get the uh, same uh, spin state. <clears throat> Uh, the gamma point uh, in ultramagnets is always spin degenerate. <clears throat> However, you can have other time reversal invariant momenta in the band structure, which can be spin split. Uh, now, when you look at the electronic structure of these non relativistic ultramagnets, they have K independent spin axes here. And their uh, spin winding number is always even, meaning when you go around the loop around the uh, gamma point, you have one. Uh, 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 full rotation of spin and another full rotation of spin. So the winding number is at least two uh, and it's always uh, even. And when you compare this uh, to the well-known relativistic systems, it's very different in all these points. Uh, they live only in inversion asymmetric crystals. Their bands are inversion asymmetric. All time reversal invariant momenta are spin degenerate you have K-dependent spin texture instead of having collinear spins, and you have always odd spin winding number. So the spin uh, rotates only once when you go around the ground. Uh, with uh, having the complete uh, spin group classification, you can also look at all possible characteristic spin momentum lockings in ultra magnets. And what you will find is that the spin winding number can take, uh, uh, can be either two, four and six, and spin can change either only in the plane, kx, ky plane, why there is no change of spin in the kx, kz plane, or you can have a bulk type of spin momentum locking in which spin changes both in the kx, ky plane, but also in the kx, kz plane. So altogether you have, t, uh, you have six uh, characteristic uh, types of spin momentum locking in ultramagnets, uh, compared 
uh, to this uh, uh, two planar, typical planar uh, uh, types of relativistic spin momentum locking of Rajba and Bresselhaus and this bulk uh, while uh, relativistic spin momentum locking. So uh, now we can uh, uh, make a list of all uh, ultramagnetic uh, spin groups. And just by listing all ultramagnetic spin groups, we can make one very important observation. When we go through the list, we see that none of the ultramagnetic spin groups has a corresponding magnetic group. So we indeed, uh, <coughs> it's very important uh, to work in the toolbox of these spin symmetries in uncoupled uh, spin and real spaces to get uh, the right symmetries that describe uh, their non-relativistic band structure, because none of these symmetries uh, or spin group symmetries have their counterpart in the uh, relativistic magnetic groups. <clears throat> now, we can do two things once we get this full uh, classifications, two elementary exercises, if you want, or two key exercises. One is that we can do a systematic ultramagnetic symmetry description of all the earlier identified so-called anti-ferromagnetic anomalies. <clears throat> uh, so uh, once we know what are all the uh, spin group symmetries, we can uh, uh, now, from the symmetry perspective, fully analyze not only the band structures, but also uh, all the phenomena that result from the band structure. And this uh, we can do in the early identified so-called antiferromagnetic anomalies in the metallic rutile ruthenium dioxide, which was the spin splitting anomaly and anomalous Hall effect anomaly. But sure enough, uh, this this uh, spin splitting anomaly was also identified in the very basic uh, classic uh, insulating rutile iron fluoride, which Neil always liked to uh, use as an example of a classic antiferromagnet. Also, this has uh, uh, spin split non relativistic band structure, and from its spin symmetry group, uh, we can determine all the basic symmetries. But there's been many other materials in which uh, there were previous identification of these antiferromagnetic anomalies, a metallic example of a manganese silicide uh, and a number of uh, insulating examples. But you can also do the other uh, exercise of trying to identify new uh, ultramagnetic materials with some uh, uh, interesting, uh, for example, electronic uh, properties. And the very useful tool uh, that is provided by this uh, spin group, uh, uh, complete spin group classification is that uh, each uh, ultramagnetic spin group is connected with a uh, non-magnetic crystallography group. So we have a complete list of non-magnetic crystallography group that can potentially allow for an ultramagnetic phase. And it's not all of them. So there are some crystallography groups that do not allow uh, for ultramagnetic phase. So this already separates uh, materials just looking at their non-magnetic crystal structures in which we can potentially look for the ultramagnetic phase. And then if we want to find more metallic uh, uh, systems, for example, then we can identify chromium antimony, which is a well-known uh, metallic system with anti-parallel magnetic order and very high nail temperature. And we, once we identify its, its a spin group, we see that it will be an ultramagnet and the spin group, for example, with the six-fold symmetry uh, will, uh, will tell us that the Fermi surface will have this six-fold symmetry even without doing the DFT calculations. And of course, the DFT calculations confirm this. Uh, and this is another example here where we identify ultramagnetism in the parent coupe of high temperature uh, uh, D-wave superconductor uh, uh, lanthanum copper oxide here. <clears throat> and again, uh, the same principle, uh, the crystallography group allows uh, for an ultramagnetic uh, phase. Once we put the antiparallel moment on it, indeed, uh, we get uh, uh, the characteristic uh, ultramagnetic uh, spin polarization of the bands here. <clears throat> so that brings me to uh, the final slide, uh, uh, in which I just want to recap that there is a broad range uh, of materials that can host uh, this third uh, basic. Uh, magnetic phase of ultramagnetism. They can be three-dimensional. Uh, they can be also two-dimensional. 
uh, there cannot be uh, uh, 1D chain uh, ultramagnetism because in 1D chains, we do not have the crystal rotation operation. Uh, we've seen that they can be insulating semiconducting metallic, but they can also exist in the crystals which host uh, high temperature uh, superconductivity. Uh, in different types of crystal structures, rutiles, uh, ruthenates, perovskites, cuprates, ferrites, uh, but also different chemistry, uh, silicides, nictites, or chalcogonides. And if you have such a broad range of materials, uh, that implies uh, uh, relevance in a broad range of uh, uh, fields of uh, science and technology. So I've already uh, shown a few examples in spintronics where we now can start building a completely new type of spintronics without both magnetization and relativity. But there are many different areas in physics. In fundamental physics, we can search for new types of exotic spin polarized quasiparticles near these ultramagnetic band degeneracies. Uh, we have now a possibility of velitronics, but it's very different from the non-magnetic velitronics because we can have velitronics at time reversal invariant momentum. Uh, uh, ultramagnets are also multiple, so uh, they can contribute to the field of multiple magnetism. Uh, and we can have insulating 2D ultramagnets that uh, shows a way towards magnetic topological insulators, including quantum anomalous Hall effect, but now with vanishing uh, magnetization. And of course, an intriguing uh, prospect of uh, interesting interplay between superconductivity and ultramagnetism. So this brings me to the end. I'll thank you very much uh, for listening. And uh, before I stop, uh, I have to acknowledge the financial support from various uh, funding agencies uh, across uh, Europe. And of course, I'd like to also acknowledge the institutional support uh, from our three host organizations. And here I would like to particularly emphasize the Institute of Physics in Prague, because as you see, it has already included ultra magnetism in its logo. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Thomas. That's uh, fantastic. Um, and. Uh, we have uh, quite a few people uh, that would like to ask some questions. Uh, so I'll start uh, with, um, I think, uh, well, Igor, uh, Boris um, had a, an initial question. Let me ask uh, if he still has it. I'll, I'll promote him in a minute, but Andrew, maybe we go first. Let me see if I can find, there it is. Um, uh, so uh, Andrew, go ahead and... Um, Unmute yourself if you can, uh, and you can ask your question, yeah? Hi, uh, thank you. That was really, a really great talk. I enjoyed it very much. Um, I guess I had a couple of short questions. Could you go back to where you talked about the automagnetic band structure, where you attributed it to crystal field splitting? Yes, and can you please speak up a little bit, uh, just so yeah. that I can hear it? If you can go a little closer phone. to the microphone. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm moving there. Uh, For instance, in, yeah, that picture. Okay, good. Yeah, this picture here. What confuses me a little is that um, a band width comes into that as well as a band, a crystal field split, right? Because it almost looks like, you know, you must, you, you, you've, got a, you've got a band width dispersing across K, you mean this, you mean, uh, for example, the A band? Yeah. Yes. So for instance, the A band has a width, but you talked about it in terms of a crystal field split and the A band doesn't have to have a width. Well, or does it? It's almost as if the crystal field split is forcing a width, so it's forcing a hopping. Yes, and that's because the local environment of the sublattice A is anisotropic. Okay. Yeah. Uh, see, I can, I could imagine levels, crystal field levels shifting around, right? But uh, it's not clear to me. I, I'm particularly interested in this for reasons that I could explain to you offline afterwards. 
Okay, I'll need to think about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I only talked about this in terms of symmetry, but of course you have to have also the right orbitals at the Fermi level that are sensitive uh, to this symmetry. And that's, uh, that's the case of ruthenium dioxide and also some other materials that you have the right D orbitals, uh, which yeah. uh, reflect or which also, which split uh, if you have this uh, uh, uniaxial, if you want uh, an isotropy of the crystal yeah. environment. So it would split the, the D orbitals in a way uh, uh, that you see here. Okay, well, I get, let, me, let me reformulate slightly differently then. Let's just imagine a standard band, right? Uh, that standard band, uh, if you had no coupling, no hopping between the sites, you would have one degenerate level. And that standard band spreads out into a bandwidth when you've got hopping between sites as the dominant mechanism rather than a uh, crystal field on site, if you like. Mm -hmm. And so here, uh, the, you know, you, you've, got a, you've got a broadened band, so you can't get that broadened band surely without intersite hopping. Uh, yes, but ho what happens is that if you look at what dominates, what type of local orbitals are dominating, let's say this state, yeah. and what type of orbitals is dominating this state, it will be just, as you say, this will be the local splitting, the local crystal field splitting uh, will correspond to the states which dominate this one and this yeah. one. So it will be the d orbitals, local d orbitals, uh, which are split because of the crystal field that will dominate this state and this state. And in the p sub lattice, it will be just reversed. Yeah, okay. Okay, but then uh, I, could, I could go in a tight binding formalism and derive an effective t, an effective intersite hopping from that bandwidth. And the way you've presented it, the value I would get for that intersite hopping would be more related to the crystal field split. Andy and Thomas mean different things. Okay, Igor Mazin is going to sort this out. Uh, but anyway, it's it's. I'm just wanting to understand. Yeah. So um, uh, maybe uh, we can. Igor is around, so I can. We I can either discuss it later, but you can also look at this reference because we have a very detailed uh, analysis based on the DFT band yeah. structure. Uh, and uh, and it's split yeah. into the contribution from the orbitals and and sites or sub lattices uh, uh, where we do project uh, the band structure and see how that really works on the microscopic level. Good. I like the talk precisely because it wasn't so detailed. But anyway, could could, could I indulge myself with one much shorter question? Is is that possible, or do you want me to 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 quit? Uh, let's move on because there's a lot of questions, and then he can maybe come back to you. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, Boris, uh, can you go ahead and ask your question, please? Boris Ivanov, yeah. My question is about some co comparison with standard uh, phenomenological theory of interferon magnet. It's uh, well established by people what interferon magnet is the only crystal uh, with magnetic ordering which have some odd element of crystalline group which replace sublattices. So sublattices should be completely equivalent from the viewpoint of uh, crystal group. Is it the case here? Yes. Otherwise, you will uh, working with not antiferromagnets, but ferry, compensated ferromagnets. Yes. For which uh -huh. everything like GMR and for all, uh, some other effects are allowed it. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you for this, uh, also for the first question, but these are all uh, very, very interesting and very good questions. So uh, yes, you need to have a crystallography symmetry operation that connects the opposite spin sublattices to have a perfect compensation and exactly zero net magnetization in the non-relativistic physics. Uh, so the physics that is generated by the exchange interaction. So uh, here, uh, it's the inversion that connects the two sub lattices and that guarantees that the system is perfectly compensated that the moments are of equal magnitude and opposite sign here uh, in our ultra magnet we also have such a uh, crystal symmetry operation and that is rotation and is this rotation which guarantees that uh, the system would be perfectly compensated and you can see it here in the electronic structure it's, it's uh, for every eigenstate of a spin-up, there will be an equal energy eigenstate with opposite spin, and their momenta will be connected by, this, by the same rotation operation as in the real space. 
So you have for each upspin, there is a downspin at the same energy, which guarantees that the system is fully compensated, has zero magnetization. Yet you can generate uh, in these systems spin current by applying electric field as shown here. Okay, so mm -hmm. in equilibrium, there is precise zero magnetization. Once you bring it out of equilibrium, you will create a net spin current. Does that answer your question? Uh, let me think a little bit. Thank you okay. for your answer. Thank you. Uh, so let's uh, go next to Leonid and then to Armando afterwards. So Leonid, go ahead and ask your question, please. Uh, I, we'll get uh, to everybody, I, so I promise. Hi. Hi. Uh... Thomas, thanks for a great talk. Um, I noticed that you list uh, Mangan and Tello, right, in uh, the same group. And um, sort of there, you do have uh, just uh, artihedral distortion in uh, one, one, one direction. And then uh, otherwise, anti -par uh, parallel uh, planes, uh, again, along one, one, one direction. So, how that uh, gives to a uh, ultramagnet. I thought it would be uh, just a regular anti magnet in such a uh, in such symmetry. So, uh, what 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 new physics uh, you would uh, expect in manganese telluride, which has not been yet discovered in that respect? Uh, well, first of all, it's been. Uh, we already have a paper uh, in which we show uh, uh, in which we discuss and show. Uh, DFT calculations of manganese telluride and that there's been split. So as you see, manganese telluride is in the same row here in the table as chromium antimony. So it will have the same symmetries as chromium antimony. And what you see here, you have the two sublattices uh, which are connected again by a rotation symmetry operation. Okay. So again, we have a detailed discussion of chromium antimony in our article, but as you see, manganese telluride would follow exactly the same symmetries. So it is an alter magnet. Okay, thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, Armando, uh, can you go ahead and ask your question, please? Uh, thank you for the nice talk. I am a little bit confused with lanthanum 2 copper oxygen 4. I mean, <clears throat> I thought that it was an ordinary anti magnet concerning crystal structure, uh, but you classify it as an alter magnet now. Uh, could you explain, please? Yes. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, we also regard this as a, as a very important result of the spin group classification that we identify alter magnetism in this very important compound. So uh, if you see uh, these uh, octahedra are mutually rotated. So there is one, there are two basically uh, reasons why alter magnetism could have been missed in the past. One thing is that this uh, rotation is not very large here. So many people would just ignore it and will just consider when thinking of the basic uh, magnetic structure uh, that, uh, that there is no mutual rotation of this octahedra. In that case, there will be a symmetry, an inversion symmetry, which would impose Kramer spin degeneracy and the bands will not split. However, in real crystal, uh, it's very well known that these octahedra are mutually tilted and once you get the tilt, you will get ultra magnetic phase. Now, the other reason, because people know about this tilt and they were looking also at the electronic structure, including the tilt, is that very often when you do RPES or when you do band structure calculations, you just look at high symmetry lines or high symmetry planes. And this is what you plot. And what you see here that you have several high symmetry lines and planes, for example, this horizontal plane is completely spin degenerate. And so you can see publications on lanthanum copper oxide, even review articles, where people would show a spin degenerate electronic structure. But what they do is that they show a cut of the Fermi surface along this high symmetry plane, which is spin degenerate. But once you go off it, you will find that the spin degeneracy is lifted and you have spin splitting. Thank you very much, very clear. Uh, great. Uh, so, Ali Reza, can you uh, uh, ask your question, please? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I had two naive questions. First is that uh, if uh, all of these alter magnets 
uh, have collinear uh, structure. And second is that uh, related to uh, last year paper by Alex Zuckler group about uh, MNF2. And they explain uh, this uh, splitting of the band based on the Rashba old paper. I'm wondering if there is any connection between that theory and also this alter magnetism that you explained here. Yes. So the first question was uh, uh, whether we uh, consider only collinear uh, magnets. So this is what we did. Uh, we were interested in really a fundamental phase and uh, uh, meaning sort of as, as simple as possible and that's collinear magnetism. And if you work in this, uh, uh, if you use the toolbox of the spin symmetries, you can really by, by symmetries, you can disentangle collinear magnets from coplanar or non-collinear, non-collinear coplanar and non-coplanar magnets. This is something which is not possible to do uh, with the relativistic magnetic group. So this was one of the reasons why we were using uh, this uh, mathematical toolbox because it allows us to disentangle collinear magnets. And this is what we were focusing on. Now, if your question would be, what would be the non-relativistic spin splitting physics in a non-collinear magnets? then uh, I say we have the tools to do this. We haven't done it, uh, but there is a tool to do it. You, instead of using this uh, uh, symmetry in the spin space only of the collinear magnets, you would move down and you, was, you would use this one, or you would move down to the non-coplanar where there is none uh, uh, pure spin space symmetry existing. You do then the same uh, uh, symmetry group uh, classification of these coupled operations, and you will have uh, uh, the description of non-relativistic uh, spin split band structure in non-collinear coplanar or non-collinear non-coplanar magnets. So it's possible to do it, but what we were after in our work so far were collinear magnets because we were primarily uh, interested in the basic uh, fundamental magnetic phase. So uh, does that answer your first question? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah. Now uh, to your uh, second question uh, about uh, Pekar uh, uh, Rashba uh, uh, 1964 paper. Uh, let me just uh, show you. I think it refers to the, 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 well, not, okay, yeah. Do the other one first and then the, the other one as well. Uh, so, uh, uh, so it's important to look uh, exactly at uh, what physics is discussed in this paper. And here is the model K dot P Hamiltonian that they are discussing. And what you see here, uh, there is a, a magnetic field, uh, uh, an effective uh, uh, magnetic field that couples to the spin here. <clears throat> and here's the definition, which contains some uh, spatially varying uh, dipolar fields in, in, in a magnet. And what you see here that the same magnetic field here also couples uh, to the momentum of the electron. So uh, in this article, they do not discuss anything uh, on symmetries. Uh, however, if I would uh, uh, look at their microscopic physics and try to describe it from the symmetry perspective, I see that their microscopic physics has coupled uh, spaces of the spin vectors and the real space because uh, their magnetic order is somehow generated by some sort of a dipolar field, uh, which couples both to the spin uh, and to the momentum of electron. So in terms of symmetry, uh, description of their microscopic physics, it would not be the uh, symmetry of spin operations of decoupled spin and real space because their Hamiltonian couples the two spaces. Now, in terms of microscopic physics, uh, it certainly is not a microscopic physics of the strong exchange. And they even say it explicitly in the article uh, that their uh, 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 field is weak, is relativistically weak. So uh, it also does not guide us in terms of the magnitude of the effects because the magnitude of the effects is governed by the strong uh, electromagnetic crystal fields in the system. While what they consider is some sort of weak uh, a dipolar field uh, uh, that may be present in such a crystal. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, he was you. actually referring to the to the Zunger paper, actually. 
No, no, no. I think uh, you, you did mention Pekka Rashba, right? Yeah, but uh, in that MNF2 paper, they refer uh, to this paper. Yes, but I think it's important that. to go to the yes. original paper. Yeah, and, that is why. Yeah, yeah and, but, uh, and but just I'm wondering that uh, is there any microscopic Hamiltonian for, for example, uh, this uh, Alter Magnus, one of the simple Yes, cases? Uh, thank you. This is a very good uh, uh, question. So first of all, <laughs> um, uh, in, uh, in our paper, we don't do only the symmetry analysis, but we always accompany uh, um, uh, the symmetry analysis with the full uh, DFT calculation. So that is certain microscopic. But it's not just that. If you would go to uh, our manuscript, you will also find for each of this uh, uh, spin group uh, symmetry, you will find a representative uh, uh, model uh, Hamiltonian, model K dot P Hamiltonian. Uh, and uh, they have this model uh, K dot P Hamiltonian have that, those characteristic uh, orbital harmonic symmetries so the D wave, G wave, or I wave. So uh, in our paper, we have symmetry analysis, we have full DFT calculations, but we simultaneously offer uh, representative K dot D model Hamiltonians that uh, are consistent both with the spin group symmetries and also uh, we can find correspondence uh, between those model Hamiltonians and the full DFT electronic structures. Yeah, thank you. It was uh, nice. Okay, uh, but does it clarify? I don't know if it clarifies with the other question that you wrote in here with the recent. Uh, uh, MN, uh, yeah, I think that the, you say that maybe explanation of MN, MN, MNF2 based on this uh, Rajva model was not correct, or I don't know. Because uh, in that paper about MNF2 in uh, Zugler, they claim that uh, what they observe is the realization of the Rajva original paper. But, well, uh, uh, if, if you allow me, let me not comment on the claims yes. in this paper, but I rather showed you what is precisely yes. in this yeah. uh, 19 uh, Pekka Rashba paper. Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, good. Uh, uh, so the next one is uh, Vaida Wu. Please uh, ask your question, please. Oh, yes. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Hello. Okay. Great. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks for the very nice talk and very illuminating talk. Um, my question is, um, maybe it's more uh, from the expandalist uh, questions, uh, namely, how, how can we relate this uh, or differentiate auto magnetism from, uh, from anti from magnetism, um, as actually earlier question already raised, uh, this kind of concern is that, um, seems to me that the, the distinction is mainly come from the band structure, right? You have this, uh, you know, uh, spin polarized band, um, uh, in the in the in the uh, momentum space that differentiate um, uh, what, what we used to think the anti magnetism and this uh, outer magnetism, and now if I pr probing like the susceptibility or the kind of a spin spin correlations from neutron scattering, for example, um, what's the difference between outer magnetism and anti magnetism? Uh, okay, so. Uh... I, I, I tried to already, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's a very broad and very, very nice question. So uh, let me try to answer at least partially. So I tried to give you examples from spin electronics uh, experiments uh, where you have a clear distinction between the spin degenerate antiferromagnets and ultramagnets. So a spin degenerate antiferromagnet cannot generate anomalous Hall effect uh, and uh, uh, it cannot, um, the, Spin degenerate antiferromagnetism cannot generate uh, anomalous Hall effect, while the spin split ultramagnetism can. Uh, spin degenerate antiferromagnetism cannot generate spin polarized currents and the corresponding giant magneto resistance, spin torque effects, etc. The non relativistic ones, while ultramagnets can. And there are indeed in both these cases, there are first experimental confirmations of these ideas. So, this was the reason why, for example, over the whole decade, of uh, research of antiferromagnetic spintronics where we were using spin degenerate uh, antiferromagnets, we had to come up with completely different uh, physical phenomena and principles to uh, detect and manipulate the antiferromagnetic order, which were all relativistic. Uh, so, uh, uh, so this is one of the clear cut, if you want, uh, experimental distinction that the phenomena uh, that you use uh, are uh, completely different. Now, in terms of other uh, experimental techniques, 
So uh, for example, in ARPES, <clears throat> when you uh, want to identify the spin splitting, of course, ARPES is not going to directly tell you whether the spin splitting is going to be of relativistic or non-relativistic origin. But what you've seen is that ultramagnets can have very large spin splittings comparable to the spin splitting in ferromagnets on the electron volt scale. And that is one or two orders of magnitude larger than the maximum spin splitting achieved in, uh, in relativistic uh, spin or by relativistic spin orbit coupling. So it immediately tells you that uh, uh, it might be much uh, uh, more easy to identify spin splitting uh, uh, in ultramagnets by RPAS, uh, even with lower uh, um, uh, sensitivity uh, because of the large magnitude of the spin splitting. When you talk about susceptibility, uh, yes, these ultra magnets would have very different uh, susceptibility uh, in applied magnetic fields uh, than, um, than spin split, conventional uh, spin split uh, antiferromagnets. One of the examples uh, to give you is that in ultra magnet, you can have a reorientation of the nail vector uh, even when you apply a magnetic field in the hard axis. That means if you apply it orthogonal to the orientation of the nail vector, in a regular antiferromagnet, you would only can the moment and eventually do a spin flip a transformation to a ferromagnetic state. While in ultra magnets, uh, you can actually reorient the nail vector in the direction parallel to the magnetic field. How does it work? Uh, it would take a little bit more time to explain, but this is just an example of a different uh, experimental phenomenology. Uh, of course, consistent, pure, perfectly with the theory. This so let's go now first now to uh, to uh, Matthias Weiler and then to Revas after that. We're still then trying to cover everybody. Go ahead, uh, Matthias. Hey, uh, yeah, yeah. So thank you, Thomas. A great, fantastic talk. So um, I have two questions from the experimentalist perspective. So one of them, from my understanding, uh, if you have a polycrystalline uh, alter magnet, right, uh, then these properties, I guess, they're Basically averaged out uh, from the symmetry, and you and it looks like an antiferromagnet. Is that true, or is there still something remaining in a polycrystalline alter magnet? It will depend uh, on what phenomenon uh, you but want. To transport look at. transport phenomena, electronic transport. Phenomena. It would depend on what transport phenomenon you you want to look at and how you want to uh, control the transport phenomena. So I'll give you one example where even if you have. Uh, 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 more crystal directions uh, or more polycrystalline film, uh, you can still uh, uh, have an effect. So for example, in, uh, <clears throat> uh, in ruthenium dioxide, anomalous Hall effect, okay? So you can uh, imagine that your film would have, so let me just go to uh, uh, an image of, uh, of the Hall effect. Uh, so, um, so uh, uh, you have the crystal. And now, of course, your anomalous Hall effect would flip sign if you reverse the nail order. This is the comparison of these two. But you can also uh, imagine that uh, the Hall effect will flip sign when you keep the nail order the same, but you have a different crystallite, in which case the, the spin-up sublattice would have rather this crystal environment. Uh, than this environment. So they, their crystal environments will be actually opposite uh, in a different crystallite, while still the magnetic moments will be the same. And uh, the reversed crystal environment would generate uh, uh, um, an opposite sign spin hall effect. But now the question is how you control the spin hall effect. Uh, sorry, the, sorry, the anomalous oh, hall effect. Yeah. How you control the anomalous hall effect. Now, if you do this by magnetic field, and that is possible, and this is how it's been done in experiment, if you try to align the nail vector in the direction you want uh, by applied magnetic field, it actually will do it uh, in both these crystallized in a way that the uh, resulting Hall effect will not cancel out, but will actually adapt, okay? Uh, again, I would need to probably walk you through this in more detail, but just showing this as an example uh, that uh, while you would sort of naively think that these two crystallites would lead to a cancellation of the anomalous Hall effect. However, if you control the anomalous Hall effect uh, through uh, bimagnetic field, through the reorientation of the nail vector, 
then uh, it will reorient in those two crystallized in such a way that the Hall effect will not cancel, but will rather add up. Okay, thank you, thank you. That is that is that is very helpful. Uh, am I allowed one other very? Short and no, but if you if you don't mind, to stick around and then we can. Okay. okay. I don't think you might stay around for all the questions, but I want to go everybody's round a little bit and then come back to the ones that wants to stick around to more discussion because there's a lot of excitement there. So Revas and then Rolando after that, and then Yonko uh, will follow. Uh, so I'm not forgetting anybody, I hope, uh, or at least put your hand up if you uh, have. Um... Go ahead, uh, Revas. Okay, uh, well, th thank you very much for, uh, for the talk. I found it very interesting and inspiring at the same time. And uh, so I have a question slash comment if I may. So in this transparency that you have on right now, uh, in, the, sort of in the middle, in the upper line, there is this uh, splitting image. There are these two Fermi surfaces uh, that are unusually split. There, there is an ellipse with the, which is elongated in one direction and then the other one spin up in one direction, spin down in the other. Uh, and if I, if I take one step back and I go to the textbook anti-ferromagnet, let's say inversion symmetric, just regular nail anti-ferromagnet, uh, just as you told us, its spectrum is doubly degenerate everywhere, right? Yes. Now, uh, you showed us how breaking certain crystalline symmetries uh, lead to what you called an, an ultramagnet uh, with, for example, with this unusual splitting that's now on the screen. Uh, however, you may choose to break different symmetries. Uh, in particular, you may apply a magnetic field uh, and of course, the, the splitting that will arise then uh, will be proportional to, to the magnetic field. But I would like to point out that the splitting you get in a transverse field with respect to, uh, to the staggered magnetization will be, well, in some cases at least, will be exactly the same as what is shown now. And so it's, it's, it's a different mechanism of splitting, but in a way, you know, I, I could almost say that the transverse magnetic field turns a nail anti-ferromagnet, a textbook nail anti-ferromagnet into what you chose to call an ultramagnet. Uh, except that of course, for weak field, the effect is proportional to the field and weak, whereas in, in the story that you told us, the effect hinges on, let's say, on, on the crystal field splitting and it is what it is in a given material. But if I were to crank up the field, I could do it up to, let's say about the anti-ferromagnetic gap in the electron spectrum. And it's, it's, it's likely of the same order of magnitude as, as the crystal field that, that you mentioned. Okay, Thomas. It's just a different mechanism, different. Uh, okay, so can Thomas maybe this one because we have already pretty long, so let's go. Okay. To Thomas so, and, and Revas, you've already given this comment several times in every talk we've given on this. So, yeah, but uh, so let's go back to I, Thomas. I, I, so okay. I would be, uh, be I would fair. Be, wouldn't yeah. it be fair to mention that work yeah. that was done? We have your work with all my respect to what you did. Wouldn't it be fair to mention? people who, who worked on similar issues before you. That's all. We have the, done this, Reva. So we, all do, we cite you and we, we cite the, the other papers. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, thank you for, for, for the comment. And uh, uh, certainly uh, there are other ways how to split antiferromagnets. You can do it by applying external magnetic field. You can do it uh, by relativistic uh, spin orbit coupling. Uh, but uh, you mentioned uh, external magnetic field. Just in general, uh, when you have a, uh, an external magnetic field, uh, uh, in that case, uh, a net magnetic moment uh, starts to be allowed by symmetry. Yes. 
So uh, uh, if a net magnetic moment is allowed by symmetry, then we are talking about different physics than ultramagnetism. Because in ultramagnetism, net uh, magnetization is prohibited by symmetry. Okay, I see, thank you. Uh, so let's go to, okay. uh, to Jonko, please. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you also thank for you the question. And thanks, Hi. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah. Hi. Yeah, this is really a great talk. One of those talks that uh, I would have hated myself to have missed. Um, so I have to recalibrate my questions because other people ask them. But if I have to say about uh, what Andrew uh, was worried about, he left. Uh, anyway, uh, I think he was at the bottom of it. He was worried about uh, <laughs> localized versus itinerant uh, magnetism, but, but that's not my question. Uh, it, it's an open issue, I think, though. So I, I even don't have a question, but if you have the slide where you showed, uh, let's call it Landau paradigm for the sake of this talk, because Landau has many paradigms. Remember when you first had the two options, uh, uh, the, the non-relativistic uh, would allow these groups of transformations and the totally relativistic, the other one, right, right there. So uh, is it fair to think then uh, not Landau wasn't wrong. The point is, um, to me, this looks like uh, uh, isomorphic to the difference between, uh, but in a different way, not, not like it's not classified. Like when we speak about quantum mechanics, there is the Schrodinger equation, non-relativistic, then uh, we, have, we have Schrodinger power equation, which introduces spin by hand, and it's extremely good. And that will be in the middle here. And then we have the relativistic description, which is nasty to do analytically. And so then catching on what you held on throughout the whole talk, you, you kept repeating, we have to think about this, it depends on what physics you're interested in. So I'll venture to say that, in fact, you have cornered one third of, of all possible magnetic materials like you showed us, right, by, by symmetry analysis. So I venture to say that it's a matter of approximation. And if the situation is such that the middle one is not um, eclipsed by either the left or the right, so it's like stands out, by nature of approximation, then of course we don't want to miss it. And to make my point uh, slightly more clear, probably uh, when I think about uh, other similar situations, so I really think this is great stuff. Uh, so another similar situation in a general sense is the metamaterials. They go back to Veselago. He just said, look, we don't need to have the optical index positive. So let's examine what will happen if it's negative. And here that's what in some sense they're doing. You're allowing for the rotation by 180 in your material, right? And you're exploring this, the consequences and it's very exciting. And I see here uh, that book by Litvin, he quoted with Opechowski, uh, that's interesting. But uh, in any case, the stuff is already there and you, you were brave enough to say, look, uh, let's explore uh, how about N is negative in a sense to me. Now, uh, uh, I, I'll venture to offer them <laughs> to, to, to illustrate my point. Uh, I'll venture to offer a Gedanken experiment if you wish. So uh, first of all, all of this is in the ground state, right? And in fact, Revaz is, uh, uh, remark was, was along these things. If you introduce further fields and effects, like, uh, well, think about temperature, uh, then of course, much of this will be destroyed. We may be going from left to right in the scheme here, depending on, on which model fits best, right? Uh, but my Gedanke experiment uh, would be the following. So imagine you, you have one of your, your auto magnets and then I'm thinking in a very trivial terms, let's say you apply pressure perpendicular to the plane where your physics plays out, the automagnet physics. So I'll, I'll apply pressure until the time when the spin lattice coupling becomes so big that I have to go to the right, physically speaking. 
And I think that's that's something that people could do. Uh, I, I, I'll stay out of it since I'm a theorist. You're good. But can, I, can you make I, it sure? I, I, so I believe at the bottom of it, this is a very viable classification, very useful, still in the spirit of uh, um, Thomas, we have to see it as approximation, okay? Okay, uh, so Thomas, would you like to comment on that uh, or? Uh, 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 first of all, I, I thank you very much for, for, for this comment. And, and uh, I think we agree in 99.9% uh, of uh, your comments. Uh, maybe where I would not completely agree uh, in terms of uh, approximation is that uh, uh, this is a toolbox that, for example, in magnetism uh, uh, is capable of describing the strong part uh, of magnetism. And now uh, there, uh, the relativistic effects typically are small corrections. There are exceptions, like anomalous Hall effect is an exception. Uh, uh, without relativistic spin orbit coupling, it will be zero in many cases or in most cases. Uh, but uh, but uh, most of magnetism is simply governed by the non-relativistic physics. And the interesting thing is that if you apply the relativistic uh, symmetry toolbox, uh, you will have uh, a much smaller uh, uh, set of symmetries available to describe it. So just because of a tiny gap uh, or a tiny correction, relativistic correction, you will completely, for example, lose the, the notion of a fourfold symmetry, which governs completely uh, your, uh, you know, uh, giant magneto resistance, et cetera, et cetera, a uh, very important phenomenon. And you will not have the symmetry language to describe it just because you want to precisely describe a teeny tiny relativistic correction. Okay. Let's move on to, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think, Rolando, and then to uh, Juer that I haven't forgotten, and then Boris, I would like to have a comment. And after that, I think we may wrap up. <laughs> uh, Hi, thank you for a very exciting talk. Uh, I had two questions here in the chat, which have disappeared. One was uh, early on in your talk, you, you sort of had this animation of the band splitting because of uh, the exchange interaction. Uh, but uh, early on, you were, and this is, I think, related to the first question by Andrew McKenzie, was that what are the energy scales that allow this, you know, kind of splitting, right? So you said the exchange interaction splits this band that much. So how can you get the exchange interaction that large that would split them? I mean, you have here another magnitude of uh, electron volts. So that was my first question. The second question is in this alter magnetism classification, can you classify incommensurate structures? Those um, are my questions. Okay, so uh, first question is uh, that, uh, uh, first is a general answer to your question and then specific to a, uh, to a material of like ruthenium dioxide or some other materials that we study. So first the general uh, answer is, uh, so this exchange splitting, and I will then play the movie uh, slowly so that you can see it. But this exchange splitting, and as is typical in ferromagnetics, is more or less K uh, independent. While you have this K dependent splitting of the bands in the non magnetic phase. So, what happens is immediately once you start to split uh, the bands here, close uh, to the gamma point, the splitting of the spin up and spin down bands will immediately be governed uh, by this non magnetic uh, crystal field splitting, even if your uh, exchange is still tiny. And as you increase the strength of the exchange coupling, a more on a larger and larger part of your spectrum will have the spin splitting determined uh, by uh, the uh, electric crystal field. So let me just play, try to play the movie and, and, and watch. So first focus on the part on, uh, near the gamma point, and you will see that immediately, even for small exchange, uh, the splitting will be already uh, determined uh, by the uh, non-magnetic uh, crystal field uh, effect. So I will play it now and you see it here, it's already there, even though the exchange is still small. And I increase the part of the spectrum and only for this very large spin, uh, exchange splitting, as you see the entire uh, spectrum, not only near the gamma point uh, will be, uh, um, uh, the splitting will be governed by the electric crystal field splitting. So that's the, the general uh, answer to your question. So 
it's, uh, um, if I would focus only near the gamma point, I can have infinitesimally small exchange uh, uh, strength and it will already uh, expose the spin splitting by the electric crystal field. The second uh, part or the second uh, answer to your question is specific to these materials. Uh, it's not only ruthenium dioxide, but it's also ruthenate, uh, potassium, uh, ruthenium uh, ox uh, uh, oxide, which we have also in this article, where we did uh, the DFT calculations. And in the DFT calculations, you will see that in fact, the entire uh, uh, band uh, uh, within, within the brilliant zone, the, the splitting is actually exposed. This uh, non-magnetic origin of the splitting is not only around the gamma point, but it's actually across the entire band structure. So that means that this exchange uh, splitting is larger, not much larger, but it's larger than this uh, uh, crystal field splitting. And that means that the entire band splitting is exposed uh, uh, of the electric origin. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and then the uh, Jure and then Boris will like a comment and then I think- so there, back, Yeah, uh, there was the oh, second part, sorry, said, about the oh, incommensurate. Oh, uh, second question, sorry, I forgot. Incommen the, about the incommensurate structures. Uh, about the incommensurate uh, structure. Can they be classified in the same fashion? Uh, that's a, a good question, which, I, which, which we have not uh, discussed um, so far. Uh, certainly not, to me, not within the, uh, the mathematical toolbox that we, uh, um, that we borrowed from Litwin, uh, where the positions of spins in real space and the positions of atoms uh, are considered to be the same. Uh, so I have not, uh, we have, or I believe we have not thought about incommensurate uh, structures. Thank you. Uh, I don't have an answer to that. Okay, actually, uh, Yuri, and then there's a question, I think Sal may also want to ask a question and then Boris. Yuri, uh, go ahead. Um, you have a good question. So first of all, uh, a great uh, talk. Thanks a bunch. Um, I have a question about LCO or coup rates, right? I mean, you, you make an example of coup rate. Uh, okay, so it's a MOT insulator, so you're not going to use it for a spin source of a spin polarized current, I presume. Um, but I'm wondering, I mean, is there something else uh, as a cause of outer magnetism that is so, so speak specific to uh, single layer cuprate, for example? I presume that if, I, if you take YBCO or something like that, despite the fact that you also have this octahedra, but the symmetry will, uh, will be different or, uh, or how is it? So again, uh, this is what, what we found very important is that the nature of ultramagnetism is not in uh, some, let's say highly so strongly correlated physics. It really originates from the electromagnetic crystal fields. So if you want, it's seen already in the DFT uh, uh, theory in the local spin density approximation. Uh, and this is, uh, so we can include correlations. You can include U and uh, various types of correlations in your DFT. Of course, your band structure will change, but not the alter, not, you will not switch on and off the alter magnetic phase. So it's already there in the, uh, let's say, uncorrelated or weakly correlated uh, uh, physics. So that, that's one comment. Uh, and uh, that really means then that uh, all you need to do is look at the uh, uh, crystal symmetries uh, uh, of your cuprates and see if they have the right uh, crystallographic group. And then of course the magnetic order uh, has to be anti-parallel uh, and it has to be on uh, two sides which are connected by some crystallographic rotation, either proper or improper. And if that is the case, then it will have the uh, alter magnetic phase. Okay, but uh, so, uh, but it doesn't go beyond that, right? Uh, or, or um, I mean, beyond that. So does does that have something to do with, for example, mod physics and whatnot, the properties of cuprates? Because, for example, LCO is slightly different in many aspects, and as for example, YBCO. I don't know whether YBCO would be also outer magnet. I, uh, it's a double layer. Um, or so 
basically you're saying, okay, it's an outer magnet, so I can use it, uh, shine a light on it, uh, and if I'm going to excite some carriers, in principle, I can generate some spin polarized current. Or yeah. is there something else to it that, that, that would make the, the, this particular material even more in interesting and important? And does it have any implication for high TC superconductivity if by any chance you're saying that this is uh, uh, over the entire class of group rates? So uh, if you look, thank you very much for this question. So if you look at the, uh, uh, um, uh, the ultramagnetic uh, band structure here, uh, if you would just close your eyes and you would not think of magnetism uh, an effective one particle, but if you, if you would uh, think of this uh, from the perspective of superconductivity and you will see such a picture, uh, you will recognize a, a picture of a, of a D-wave symmetry, a superconducting band gap, right? And this is the reason why we also did this uh, orbital harmonic representations of all these ultramagnetic band structures, just to highlight the potential connection, because we, we have a D-wave harmonic uh, representation of the ultramagnetic band structure in a parent cuprate of a D-wave superconductor. We are not saying that ultramagnetism therefore explains the D-wave superconductivity. But what we are saying is that you have a material uh, in which you have a symmetry uh, which uh, uh, is responsible for the anisotropic uh, 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 magnetic band structure, ultramagnetic band structure, and simultaneously, of course, for the anisotropy uh, in the superconducting band gap. Now, whether these two are just two parallel independent reflections of the underlying symmetry of the crystal, or whether there is some interplay between those two uh, 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 broken symmetry, different types of broken symmetry states. Uh, that's a question which uh, I certainly don't have an answer, but uh, I am quite certain that people have not considered uh, this uh, before because people did not realize that there is such a, a spin structure uh, in the band structure of cuprate. So it is just suggestive that uh, it, it's an important to me direction of future research to see if there is some interplay between those two phases. Great, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, let's, uh, I think Boris wanted to ask a question. I think Yonko may have a comment as well, but, uh, or, or may I have a comment? Uh, Boris, can you comment? And then we'll try to wrap it up. I think Thomas, we've used his time quite enough. <laughs> it's one of the longest Q&A sessions I've had. Uh, Boris, uh, did you like to make a comment? Uh, you wanted to say something? Unmute. Yeah. Yes, no, my no. comment yeah. is about, again, about the, my, my question and the answer. In principle, I agree. In your system, there is this uh, odd element is for usual antiferromagnet. You said what this odd element, which replaces sublattices in the crystal lattice, and by the way, change the sign of the nail vector. You said what it should be some space reversal. In principle, there is uh, some other cr crystal group elements can be odd. For example, it can be translation. But for the magnets with more than one spin for elementary cell, uh, either translation or um, inversion can be not odd elements. And there is a lot of examples in antiferromagnets. For example, this is orthophorites and uh, manganese fluoride, which is rutile. In that case, you have two spins for crystalline elementary cell, and the rotation is the odd element which transforms one sublattice to another one. It seems to me what in your picture, what you show a lot, there is four spins, but <laughs> not four elementary cells. Two. Yes, four. yes. And so, in for uh, and this, I cannot. Well, it's co common to what for uh, manganese fluoride. You have two atom for the elementary cell, and uh, in principle, in that case, this odd operation can be rotation, and it has been discussed for antiferromagnets for many of them. Usually, it leads to some kind of. Um, non-collinear non-collinear antiferromagnetism 
the point is what all the crystal what I mentioned uh, manganese fluorite or orthophorites are not metals and maybe for them this great effect of uh, for spectrum of the conducting electrons is not manifest themselves but it seems to me again what it is very common to to standard antiferromagnet well standard uh, anti uh, I guess uh, uh, maybe it's just a matter of terminology, uh, but uh, uh, if you compare what, what I was trying to compare here, it's, 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 uh, it's a lattice, which has only two magnetic atoms in unit cell. Uh, whether you have this lattice or this lattice, they have only two uh, uh, magnetic atoms in unit cell. And uh, the difference is that in this case, uh, the two opposite sublattices are connected by the crystallographic rotation. Once this is the case, uh, you will have, and this can be proper or improper rotation, then you will have ultramagnetism. But you do not need to have only uh, collinear uh, compensated magnets with two uh, uh, magnetic atoms per unit cell. Uh, you can have four, for example. And it, interestingly, if you have four, then you don't even need to have uh, these non-magnetic atoms to break the inversion symmetry connecting the opposite spin sublattices. You can have it just with four atoms in unit cell, then uh, you can have broken inversion connection between opposite spin sublattices and there will be, but you can still have rotation which connects them. And then you will have also an ultramagnetic phase. The example is the manganese uh, silicide which has four magnetic atoms per unit cell. So our uh, 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 analysis or uh, our description of ultramagnets is not limited uh, to crystals which have only two uh, magnetic atoms in unit cell. I was just uh, referring to this one for simplicity, but you can have, uh, uh, you can have a higher number of magnetic atoms in unit cells and still uh, be described by the same spin symmetries or spin symmetry groups that I just uh, described to you. Uh, and they all, uh, once the opposite spin sublattices are connected by proper or improper rotations, they will have uh, spin splitting allowed and the spin uh, uh, splitting uh, and spin degeneracies will be determined uh, by the uh, non-relativistic spin group symmetries for the specific material. Well, in that case, I would like to say what probably this condition is very common to what for appearance of the lashinsky moria interaction uh, leading to an uncollinear magnetic structure, weak ferromag ferromagnetism for antiferromagnet and so on. Because uh -huh. the condition is the same. Uh, uh, what the translation and inversion are not uh, odd elements. Yes, yes, it's, it's related. Uh, but uh, DMI uh, is a relativistic effect. Uh, weak magnetization is relativistic effect. What we were after here was the non-relativistic physics, starting from the non-relativistic spin splitting, uh, which was commonly considered to be absent in antiferromagnets, and all the resulting phenomena, not only spintronics, but in many different fields of physics. Okay? Thank you, Mari. Uh, yep. Probably. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you thank you for your question. It's well. a very good comment as well. Okay, and one, one very last little question, if you may, uh, uh, Thomas, because I think, uh, I, I think, oh, did I promote it or not? Uh, uh, yeah, well, I had a small question. I wanted to make sure that they have, because they get up, they're standing, looking as a panelist, I think. Yeah, uh, Maya, uh, could you ask your question? You had a short question, which is, I think we can answer quickly enough. Oh, yes, thank you. Yeah. So this question is representative of uh, Sang Wu Chong at Rogers University. So he is curious whether uh, non-magnetic polar metal can be regarded as uh, outer magnetic. So his question is, is non-magnetic polar metal ultra magnetic? Can it be? Non-magnetic uh, polar metal, ultramagnetic, no. Uh, you have to have magnetic order. You have to have broken time reversal symmetry uh, to have an ultramagnetic phase. 
Okay. okay. So all our uh, ultramagnetic uh, materials and their description by the spin groups, uh, uh, they have broken time reversal symmetry. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, good. Uh, so with this, I think I'm going to stop it here for a second. One uh, quick second. I'll stop at the end streaming here. Um,